that this message series though that we're on right now has the potential to speak to so many people in a really, really powerful way. And the title of this series is simply Pursuit. Real simple, what are we pursuing? Tonight's about pursuing money and stuff. I simply title it, How Do I Get Rich? Because I know most of you have already probably Googled that. Last week, we talked about how do I get famous, the pursuit of fame, micro-famous, I want to be known and liked, right? Humanity is often consumed by this continual pursuit for more, right? If I could only just get a bit more of that, if I could only get a bit more of this, then I'd finally find fulfillment. I'd finally be happy. I'd I'd finally be, be more satisfied, fulfilled. That's what I'm missing, right? To only find out once you have that or this, that it actually doesn't quite fulfill you like you thought it would. So what do we do, friends? We get back on the treadmill, right? We get back on the rabbit's wheel, and we continue to pursue for what? For more of what we think is that or this that's actually going to fulfill and satisfy me. We continue the pursuit for more, don't we? Just me? A couple of you. That's good. So in this series of talk episodes, the themes that we are covering are the pursuit of fame. I want to be known. That was last week. I want to be admired. I want to be liked. I want to be followed on my social media or whatever it might be, right? I want to be famous or at least micro-famous, right? And then next week, week number three, we're going to talk about the the elusive pursuit of perfection. Those of you who are perfectionists, this will speak to you next week, I believe. Absolutely. We're also going to talk about the need for approval, this pursuit for approval. So many of us, rather than, than living our lives from the approval of God, we end up obsessing with what other people think about us. And that actually compromises who we're called to be. And then in the final week, we're going to talk about the drive, this passion, this hunger for comfort in our lives. See, comfort is an idol in our host culture. And I would say that comfort is often creeps into our Christian cultural norm as well. We are in pursuit for comfort in my life. I'll be honest, I am sometimes. Comfort. We're, we want, what's interesting to me is our host culture continues to teach us that, it, that comfort is actually what we really need, just to be comfortable. The challenge is this, though, friends, for us faithers or those who are following Jesus, is it's almost impossible to live for comfort and by faith at the same time. Today, though, what I want to talk to you about is something I believe probably impacts all of us, probably most of us at least, anyways. I know that it certainly impacts me. So we're going to talk about chasing, pursuing money and things, material stuff from this world. And hey, just I want to put a plug in for Rick and Angie at the same time. We've been going through the Blessed Life series on Friday nights. And we've been talking about money and how God talks to us about money. And then the practical application about budgets and credit cards and interest and all this stuff that a lot of times we don't talk about this stuff in church. And then we wonder why I'm not really making ends, ends meet. Or I'm wondering why, why am I living from such debt load and so I encourage you, like, if you're struggling with finance or financial management, then what I encourage you to do is jump in on the last couple nights, at least take in those two, and we'll catch you up on the first two. And I, I believe you'll be encouraged in that. But we're chasing more money and things and material stuff from this world. And so before we dive in today, I just want to get a little bit of help from you. Is it okay if I get a little bit of help from you tonight? I want to ask you a few questions. Let's have some fun for a moment, okay? Let's have a little bit of fun. Mm-hmm, game show time. How many of you would say honestly that you wouldn't mind being rich? If that's you, raise your hand all around the room. Ooh, there's a few of you in here. I'm like, yeah, raise your hands, raise them high all over the place. We want to get rich. Mm-hmm. Just a few. That's good. How many of you would say that you know somebody who is rich? Raise your hands. Yeah, yeah, a few of you too as well. Good, good. Here's what I'm wondering though. Have you ever looked at someone who's rich and you thought to yourself, Mm, girl, if I were rich like him or that person, I would do so much better at being rich than they are at being rich. Like, man, they're kind of being stupid rich, right? Like, I would have at least bought a different car than that or a house better than that up on the hill maybe. Or I would have invested differently than that, right? Like, kind of, I'd be smart rich if I was that, if I had that person's riches, man. 
right? Now this, is a, now, this is a little bit more difficult question I have for you. How many of you in this house are really, really, really rich? <laughs> a couple of you, yeah. Some of you know what I'm going to be talking about tonight, I think. Yeah, yeah, it's good. <laughs> really, really rich. Now, this is what I know. I know that most of you just said that you're not really, really rich, but you'd love to be or like to be really rich or at least rich, right? And so like so many people in this world, you continue to pursue. I sometimes continue to pursue for the wrong things even and long for. And I might even say we might even lust after money or things, more stuff. We crave it. We desire it so much. If I could only just have a a little bit more of that, I could be happy. See, research on this idea shows us what people would say that they would actually do for more money in their life. Here's what research research says about what people would do for five. What would you do with $5 million? What would you do? Here's what research research is saying. What would you do for $5 million? According to research, 54% of people would listen to country music for the rest of their life. (gasps) Some of you are like, no, girl, that's not me. Not for five million bucks, not in my lifetime. Some of you are like, oh, yeah, I love country music. I mean, really, here's another interesting one, though. 42% of people said they would have all of their teeth removed for five million bucks. Like, who needs teeth when you got five million bucks? Man, just buy a new grill, right? Gold plated and all. Like, dude... 50% said for $5 million, they would allow one random person on earth to die. 50% of people. And this one's even harder for me to get my mind wrapped around. 50% of people, right? 24% of people said they would live in solitude for the next 20 years in order to have $5 million. Some of you are like, oh, I could do that. Some of you are like, oh. Gallup researcher and polar (laughs) interviewed a lot of people to find out, well, what is rich then? In other words, if you want to be rich, at what point will you know that you're actually rich? Now, hang on with me for a bit, for a few minutes here, okay? We'll get where we're going tonight. I want to talk about this and, and build some facts into this for you tonight. At what point will you know that you're actually rich? When do you have enough money and stuff in your life for you to say, okay, now I have finally crossed the finish line. I finally arrived. I am rich. What's interesting is that the responses vary depending on where someone lived, where someone was, right? For those who made $30,000 a year, the average per- response of what you would need to, to feel rich or to be rich was $74,000 a year. Now, if you slightly over doubled your income, you might feel rich if you were at $30,000 income right now. There are some of you who make $74,000 a year and you say, I got news for you, honey. That doesn't feel very rich, right? For those who make $50,000 a year, they responded that it would take about $100,000 a year to feel rich. Double, right? $100,000 to some of you doesn't feel very rich though, does it? Especially where we live. I mean, did you see the fuel prices on the way to church today? (laughs) But that's what people are saying that they would need through these researches. What's fascinating to me, is they ask the top income earners, that's like we're talking six figures now, right? Well into six figures. Those people, what would it take to be rich? And the average response was $5 million in assets. Then you're rich. So if you're the poor joker who's only got $2 million in assets, you don't feel very rich. Because you feel like you need $5 million to be rich. What do I know about you and I is that maybe you don't feel rich. Maybe you'd like to be rich. And and so what do you do? Like many of us, we live with this continual pursuit for more. What is rich? Rich is actually a moving target for you, friends. A moving finish line. I'd say that there are many of us in the room that are like me earlier, earlier on in my life. I believe that if I could only get to this point in my finances, if I could only get to this point in owning a house or a car and having a good job, whatever it might be, make this much year, have this much stuff. At that point, I will feel like I've been successful. Maybe even rich, right? Like that should be enough to live on. And guess what happened? I crossed that line. And what do you think happened? The line moved. 
and I crossed another line and the line moved again. What do you need to be happy and fulfilled to feel rich in your life, to be satisfied in your life? Most people would say, I'm not quite sure, but what I know is it's always a little bit more than what I have right now. And this is why Jesus talks so much about this, about having the right perspective on money and things. In fact, in Luke's gospel, in Luke 12 and 15, if you have your Bibles, your paper, your digital, if you don't have it, you just want to sit and watch and reflect. We'll have it on the screen for you as well, Luke 12 and 15. This is what Jesus himself said. He said to a group of people, then he said to them, watch out, exclamation. Be on your guard against all kinds of greed. Life does not consist in an abundance of possessions. He's saying, watch out, friends. Be on your guard. In other words, you better be aware of this because this is a very, very real danger here for you and I. Watch out and be on guard on, against all kinds of greed or greediness. And then Jesus says, because life does not consist in the abundance of possessions. Your life, the quality of your life is not measured by the volume of the things that you own or your stuff. So he says, be on guard. Be very, very careful. Because everything in our host culture is shouting at you and I that you need this and you need that and you need so much more of this again and again. And it's dominating our ears and it's loud and it's a clear message that you're going to keep on hearing from our host culture. And this, what you don't have is what you actually need to be happy and fulfilled in life. You need more of this? You need more of that? And if you finally get what you don't have, that's what you're missing. And so that's why Jesus said you have to be on guard for this, friends. Your life does not consist in the abundance of stuff In fact, Jesus also gave a very powerful illustration to another rich guy. He talked about this guy in in Luke 12. And in the story, he said to this rich man who had a great harvest, like the guy had had a bumper year of crops, right? Maybe you were a zucchini farmer, and this year you had so many zucchinis. You're like, wow, I've got zucchinis coming out my barns, right? What am I going to do? Like it's been, I've got all this money coming and all these crops. And, and like what many of us would do, the guy says, I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to tear down all my micro barns. I'm going to tear down all my small greenhouses. And I'm going to build myself bigger barns. And then I'll be able to retire early because I'm going to have so much wealth and so much stored up for myself, right? I'll finally be able to take it easy, maybe retire early and party it up a little bit. This is what God said to that rich guy. God said to him, this Luke 12 and 20. It's a hard way to hear it, but he says, you fool. This very night, your life will be demanded from you. Then who's going to get what you have prepared for yourself? This is how it will be with whoever stores up things for themselves, but is not rich toward God. Here's what I believe is fascinating about this story. God wasn't mad at this guy for being rich, by the way, right? God gave the increase. He's a farmer, right? God gave him the seed. God gave the weather, the sun, the rain, whatever. Gave this guy a bountiful harvest. God gave him a gift, per se. But God was disappointed in this guy's behaviors because he was not rich toward God. He was only in it for himself what I can store up for myself here on this earth, rich in the things of this world, but he was totally missing being rich in the things that mattered most. So with that in mind, friends, I want to tell you some good news, and then we're going to share some bad news. I don't know about you. Some of you like to hear the bad news first, but this is the way I got it in my notes. So I'm going good news first. The good news is this, and I hope you're going to understand that this is really, really good news. Don't miss it. Pay close attention. The good news is this. You are rich. Some of you already got that tonight. I saw some of those hands go up. You are very, very, very rich. I know. I asked you if you're rich. Most of you said, "Mm -mm, I don't think so, girl. I don't feel very rich today. You didn't see my bank account, right? But you, friends, are rich. And most of you don't really feel it. You don't really feel rich because you feel like you got more bills than you got money. 
but you're rich and you don't feel it, right? When we get a little bit of perspective and recognize that there is probably around 3 billion plus or so people in this world today who are living on $2 or less a day. And some of you spent $5 on coffee on your way to church, like me some days. It starts to put it, it into perspective that based on where most people live in the world, we actually in North America, in this city where it's still pretty high to live, a high cost of living here, we are still very, very rich. In fact, you can often tell just how rich you are <laughs> by the things that upset you, by the things that offend you, by the things that irritate you, right? Like when you get really, really mad, when you ordered your favorite thing on Amazon Prime and it came in five days instead of two, like that, it gets a little annoying. I wanted it yesterday. It's my favorite doggy treats. Come on, Amazon. Or maybe our fast food order that, you know, we drive through a drive through here in North America. We're talking about being rich, and we don't really feel like it some days. And you didn't even get your favorite, favorite dipping sauce, and you had to go back around and go in and get your favorite dipping sauce. These things that irritate us, these things that frustrate us. Or your Disney or Netflix wouldn't connect to Wi-Fi last night, and it's like, it's my only night to watch my favorite whatever. You can often tell how rich you are by what bothers you. I mean, when you step back and you really think about it, that you can play nearly any song that you want from your iPhone or your Oppo or whatever smartphone you might have. Right? You can you could stream any movie and play games, and when we get hungry, you can literally drive through or go to DQ, or, and on your way to DQ, you pass 10 or 12 restaurants. You're like, nope, nope, mm, nope, nope, DQ it is, right? To have, to have someone else cook my meals and to prepare my plate and deliver it to me and to put some little garnish on it, even cleaning up after me, and we complain because it took seven minutes. <laughs> That's how rich we are, friends, most of us here. The good news is this, you're really, really rich. Now, I also know that right now in this room, there are some of you who are facing extreme financial situations in your life. And in no way do I want to minimize the sufferings that you're walking through either. Some of you are facing some, some debts, some crisis, and it's hard to, you don't know where the rent bill is going to, where the money is going to come from. Grocery price prices are increasing and maybe going through a divorce or you're a single parent that's fighting to stay alive. And I don't want to minimize the experience that you are going through, but overall, the vast majority of people in this room and in this city that I'm talking to right now are actually doing pretty okay. We're pretty rich. rich. If we could acknowledge before God that he's actually blessed us, that compared to most people in the world, we're really, really rich. Then what I want to do then, since I'm starting to recognize that I'm pretty rich comparing to the majority of the world who lives off less than $2 a day, what I want to do is I want to be very good at being rich. I want to be rich in a way that, that honors God and, and honors one another. So in order to be good at it, First, you have to acknowledge that you're rich. And that, by the way, that's why most of us aren't very good at financial management, by the way. Because we haven't actually acknowledged just how blessed we are. Now, I'd actually, I'd love for you just to say it with me if you really believe it. Can you say it with me? I'm rich. I'm rich. Now, maybe we can say it again this time, with a, maybe with a smile on your face. I'm rich. Like you believe it almost. My God has blessed me and I'm rich. And if for a moment, friends, you feel maybe a little bit uncomfortable saying that because often us passive aggressive Canadians, we are, most of us, right? We have a hard time saying these things sometimes. And if for any reason you feel uncomfortable saying I'm rich, I want you to ask yourself, why do you think you feel uncomfortable? Why do you think you might feel a little embarrassed by that? Why do you think you might even be a little apologetic? I love what Solomon says in Ecclesiastes chapter 5 and verse 19. He said this about God. He says, 
Moreover, when God, everybody say God, when God gives someone wealth, see who gives wealth? God gives wealth. No, I'm a self-made man. I don't think you're hearing me, Chris. I've worked hard and I went to school for 24 years and I've worked a union job and I'm a self-made man. No, actually God made you first. You have gifts, you have talents, you have opportunities. You were born in a place where we have so many opportunities at our fingertips, right? And God is the one behind all of it. When God gives, he's saying, when God gives someone wealth and possessions and the ability to enjoy them, to accept their lot and be happy in their toil. See, some of you, it's hard to be happy in your job, but sometimes it's about saying, God, thank you for that job. I'm going to accept my lot and I'm going to be happy in the toil that I'm doing because God has blessed me with it. What is this? This is a very gift from God. But if for a moment you feel embarrassed or apologetic or ashamed, ask yourself, in what areas, other areas of my life, are you blessed and embarrassed by that blessing? Think about it. I've got a great marriage with Angela, my wife Angela. And I don't feel guilty about it. I, I'm healthy. I've got two great kids and a silly dog, you know, like. I don't feel bad about these blessings. I don't feel guilty for my health. See, you don't apologize for any other areas of blessing in your life, but this one area, for some reason, sometimes we get kind of insecure about it. Like it came from God, friends. Everything you have, God owns it, and God gave it to you to steward, which just basically means good management. And it's a blessing from him. I'm rich. My God has blessed me. And that's such good, good news. The good news, friends, is you're rich. Now, there's bad news too. The bad news is you're rich. It can really be bad news. Being rich actually puts us at, can put us at a tremendous spiritual disadvantage. In fact, Jesus had a very meaningful conversation with a rich dude, a powerful young man about his stuff and his money that was so important to him that it hindered him. It kept him from becoming a follower of Jesus. It kept him from being a disciple of the way of Jesus. And this is what Jesus said to this rich and powerful guy in Luke 18 and 24. Jesus looked at him and said, how hard is it for the rich to enter the kingdom of God? Question mark. Indeed, he says, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. Now, we can unpack that scripture, but that's not where I want to go tonight. But what I want to do, remind you, is the good news is you're rich. You're blessed. And the bad news sometimes can be that you're rich because it can be a tremendous spiritual disadvantage to you. Why? Because you already have a roof over your head. You've got food in the pantry. You can pretty much buy whatever you want. You probably haven't even had the privilege of the blessing of praying, God, would you provide me the daily bread that I need today? Because you've already got a pantry full of Cheerios anyways. And we sometimes miss out on the provision of God providing for us. It's also a disadvantage because we're so distracted. We have... Rich people options, right? We have rich people opportunities. We're so rich and blessed with opportunities all around us. And we're overwhelmed. And we're exhausted, tired, and often missing out on what matters most. If you don't believe me in some sense, here's what I would encourage you to do is to take a trip to a developing nation. And you'll be shocked by the extreme poverty that you are faced by, faced with. You won't believe what you see. And you'll feel so much sorrow and compassion for those people. On day three or four of your trip, you might even realize that they have something that you don't even have. They've got time with people. They've got relationships, family relationships. They have, often have intimacy with God. And you know what they don't have that you have? Is your pocket full of stress and anxiety and the burden of managing all my stuff. It's a disadvantage sometimes to have so much. 
Another reason that it's a disadvantage is this, because Scripture says, to whom much is given, much is required. In other words, it's great you're rich because you truly can enjoy what God has given to you, and that honors God when you get to enjoy the blessings and the gifts that he's given you. But God also expects more of us because we're rich. We truly have what we would call a greater responsibility. And all the time we're rich, every moment of every day, culture is shouting at you. What you don't have is actually what you need. You need a newer phone. You need some newer kicks. You need a better TV, bigger for sure. A purse maybe, a car, the flooring, the furniture, the countertops, right? And don't get me started on vacations. I need another vacation in order to be happy because what you don't have is what you need. That's the news bulletin of our world, right? And that's why Jesus said, be on guard, friends. Why? Because a person's life, while it really matters, doesn't consist in the abundance of money and stuff. And here's what I know about, about you and I, because it's true about me too, right? We know this in our heads, but the problem is that our lifestyles do not often reflect that truth. And if you're really, really honest, like we want to be really, really honest, right? If we're really honest, you might say, yeah, you know what? I'm, I'm actually spending more than I make right now. Why? Because probably because we've bought into the lie that more stuff is actually what we need. More stuff is really what matters. If I could just get that now, I'm going to be happy right away, right? Yet, here's what we have to understand. Whenever we believe the lie that more money and more things and more stuff is truly what we need to be blessed and to be happy, we have to be also begin to recognize that we are under the curse or what you might call the burden of money. You might be under the curse of stuff and and more stuff. And whenever we believe that our problems can be solved by more stuff and more money, we are under the burden. We are under the curse of that money, stuff, more things. And that's not the burden that you're designed to carry, friends. More money isn't going to help your kids stay off drugs. More money is not going to heal someone who is sick of cancer. More money will not make your depression go away. More money won't save your marriage as much as she or he is telling you it will. (laughs) What we don't need is more of what's temporary. Friends, what we do need is more of what is eternal what lasts beyond the temporal, that lasts beyond your living, breathing days, that lasts beyond your legacy, beyond your tombstone, beyond whatever you are leaving behind. It lasts into each. What we do need is more of Jesus, more of him and less of me like we learned last week. More Jesus, more Jesus. That's what I need in my life. I don't want to be under the power and the curse and the burden of something of this world. Instead, I want to be under the power and the influence of the Holy Spirit, friends. Living in the blessings and the overflow of the eternal world. Living a life that truly honors God. And that's what I love about Paul. In Scripture, Paul is telling young Timothy in 1 Timothy 6 and 7. Paul, he's been mentoring this young preacher guy trying to lead him along into something that's better. And what Paul's telling him to talk to, he's telling him to talk to rich people. <laughs> and when he's talking to the rich people, he's actually talking to you and I too, friends. So don't hear this as somebody else's rich. We've already established that, right? So hear this as God's word to you and I. Paul tells Timothy this. He says, command those who are rich. We establish we're rich right now, tonight, right? right? Who's that? Say it with me. Everybody say, it's me. I'm rich. I'm rich. Command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant, In other words, don't think you're all that in a bag of chips just because you have it, right? He says, nor to put your hope, their hope, in wealth. So rich people, don't put your hope in wealth, which is very uncertain. uncertain. But instead, put your hope in God. Who does what? Our God, who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. In other words, don't feel guilty when you're rich. God has given you what you have. 
God blesses. He's a good God and he loves to bless his children. And he freely blesses us. When you are faithful, even with a little, God blesses you even with more. This is how good our God is. And some of you have just been so faithful and you've taken what God has given you and you, and you steward it, you managed it and you've maximized it and you've multiplied it. It's a blessing and it's from God. So don't feel guilty, but you know what you need to do? You need to feel responsible. God has blessed you and it's not all for you. But you have every right to enjoy it at the same time. You have every right to spend it on your family, to invest into your family to have a nice place to live, to drive a new car maybe even, to, to live a, a great life because God has blessed you with it. But it's not all for you. To whom much is given, and that's most all of us, much is actually expected. And that's why God's word to us rich people in this is this in 1 Timothy 6 and 18 this time. Verse 18 He's telling Timothy again, Timothy, command them to do good, to be rich in good deeds and to be generous and willing to share. And in this way, they will lay up treasure for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age so that they may take hold of the life that is truly life. He says, command them to do do good, to be rich in what? To be rich in good deeds. And rich people in this room, I'm talking to all of us here, we're all rich people now, we've established that, right? We need to learn how to be generous and to be willing to share. And I love this with all my my heart, it says in this way, in this way they will lay up treasures for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age. Why? So that they may take hold of life, the life that is truly life. Jesus talks about life more abundant, that's what we're talking about tonight. So they may enjoy the depth of the blessings and the goodness of our good God. The character and the nature of our good God. So what do we do? We be generous and we're willing to share and be rich in good deeds so that you can take hold of life that is truly life. God has blessed me. Everybody say it with me. God has blessed me. God has blessed me. I am rich. I actually have a slide Melanie, it's the last slide. I, I believe it's something we can, we can learn to declare over our lives. And maybe if you, if you have your smartphone, take a picture of it and learn how to start declaring this over your life. Or write it down if you've got a paper and pen. But you, do we have it up there? God has blessed me. Does it show it? On the screen? God has blessed me with more than I need. I'm rich. But I will not trust in my riches. But in him who richly provides. Because I have more I will give more and I will do more. This is living rich. We're talking about the pursuit of more, friends. But you are rich. You can get off the hamster wheel of pursuing more money and fame and fortune. And This is really good news. We're rich and we're blessed. But instead of letting this become bad news in your life, when your money and your stuff becomes distracting in your spiritual formation, and you start living by sight and not by faith, when it becomes more about me and less about him, don't let your blessings become a spiritual disadvantage in your life. More is expected of you. It's simply more responsibility. So I don't know about you, but with everything in me, I want to live this out loud. Our God, my God, has blessed me with more than I need, friends. But I will not trust in my stuff, but in the one who richly has provided the things he's given me. And because he has given me more with everything in me, I am called, I'm equipped, I'm empowered, and I'm honored by God to give more and to do more, to advance his kingdom here and now, to make a difference in this temporary world that we're living, the temporary things of this world, to overpromise and underdeliver all the time. Every one of us has already probably discovered that. Church, we can take steps today to do something that matters for eternity. We say it all the time. We are a church that exists to make an eternal impact in this city because God has made an eternal impact in my life. So let's do something that lasts. Let's do something that makes a difference like only rich people can make a difference doing. 
Let's take what's been given to us and let's invest it to be a blessing to others. Maybe this week you'll feel challenged to to step out on a limb and, and pay your friend's rent anonymously. Maybe you'll take steps this week to to serve in the kids' ministry. Maybe you'll take steps to to give someone your phone that you kind of don't need because it's your second one anyways, and they could use a phone. Maybe instead, you know, you can can grab some, some boxes this week and help somebody move. Simple things that we could do to be a blessing, to be a gift, time and energy and finances. Maybe you'll, you'll step out and serve at one of our local missional partners this, this week and months to come. Give your time to help someone who doesn't have what you have. Maybe you'll take steps this week to tithe of your first fruits, bringing your first and best back to God. Maybe you'll save up your money and instead of going on another vacation, you invest your money to go to another part of the world that could use a little help. You can go invest your money Instead of going on a vacation to have fun on a beach, you could go and help somebody and enjoy that week of vacation doing something that makes a difference for someone else's life. Giving your time, your talent, your treasure. See, when we lose our life, friends, that's when we really find it. Again, Timothy, command them to do good. Friends, I'm going to command you to do the same thing tonight because this is scripture that's alive and well for us tonight. To do good, to be rich in good deeds, to be generous and to be willing to share. They will lay up treasure for themselves so that that they may take hold of the life that is truly life. See, friends, what you don't have is not what you need to truly be happy in life. So if you're in pursuit of money and things, tonight's your night. So all around the room, I want to just put on some background music for a moment. I want to give you an opportunity to pause. Don't hold your breath, but reflect because we're going to pray. Holy Spirit's been speaking to us. Holy Spirit's been speaking to me all week as I've been preparing to bring this to the table tonight. Chris, what are you pursuing? Is it more of me and less of you, Chris? Is it really more of me and less of you, Chris? And I think we can be honest with ourselves tonight as we reflect, what are we pursuing? Are we pursuing fame? Last week, Are we pursuing more money, things, stuff? All around the room, if you would close your eyes and bow your heads. Father, today.